Um, we have prepared some um, slides for today. So uh, if with your permission, we would like to uh, use the slides as, a, as, as the talking uh, material through our presentation. And uh, we plan to finish within 20 minutes as in to allow for enough time for Q&A. Yes, sure. So without further ado, let me try to share my screen. Share screen. Share screen. Oh, here we go. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Can you all see our screen? Yes. Okay. Um, shall I start? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, Professor Pink, for having us and uh, having uh, George and myself invited. Uh, and congratulations on uh, organizing this uh, great event. Congratulations also to the whole Glowcure team. Um, congratulations also to the uh, other translators of the Quran. Uh, you're doing an inspirational job. And uh, as we will, uh, elaborate further on uh, we are not the translator but we are uh, the editors because the translator was my father and it is a great honor for us to um, to represent uh, him today and also to represent uh, the family and even to represent his uh, followers uh, who are here also among the the viewers and listeners so great to have you uh, in this um, meeting. So um, let me go to the next slide. This is a brief overview of today's uh, subjects that we would like to discuss. Uh, we will start with a short uh, bio of ourselves, and then uh, I will talk you through a overview of, um, let's say, the makeup of the Muslim minorities in the Netherlands. Uh, I'll continue with some uh, Quran translations in Dutch, which are noteworthy uh, and also significant uh, in the history. And then I will uh, proceed with uh, giving a short bio of the author of the Edele Quran, uh, the late uh, Dr. Sofian Sauri Siregar. And then um, my, uh, my friend George will tell you more about the history and context of the Edele Quran. The Edele Quran explained, so that means uh, the methodology and the use of language, and also some uh, academic comparisons with other translations in the Dutch language. And uh, we would like to uh, end with some closing remarks. Uh, obviously, um, the point uh, which is not here is there is still also time and um, enough uh, uh, yeah, time and space for questions. Should I start? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, I think uh, Professor Pink uh, did already some of the uh, yeah. ABR stuff. So. Yeah, so, so our biography, uh, I'm the old, uh, eldest child of uh, the author and his uh, other two children uh, are, I assume, listen, listening and also joining this call. Uh, my sisters, uh, uh, Sabrina Siragar, who is a surgeon, uh, uh, cardiothoracal surgeon uh, based in Rotterdam, and my other sister, Sharifa Siragar, is a, um, works in the automotive industry in Sweden, in Gothenburg, where she resides, and my mother, Berliantri um, Astuti Hasibu and Siregar lives in The Hague. And uh, well, uh, the rest has already been said by uh, Professor Pink. <laughs> Maybe a short introduction by yourself, George? Well, yeah, very short. Uh, so uh, indeed, I used to be one of the um, uh, students, uh, I, private students of uh, Sufyan Sawi Siregar in the 90s, actually. So. Uh, he, amongst others, teach me the basic of uh, Arabic grammar and mostly uh, 
issues related to Islamic law. I think that's enough. And now you're doing a PhD. And I'm, uh, yeah. And currently I'm doing a PhD, which is actually kind of the output of the adventure I started with the with the late author of the Edel um in the 90s. Yes. Okay. Uh, something about the Muslim minorities in, uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, some numbers which might be interesting for you. Um, so um, approximately 5% of the total population is accounted to be uh, of Muslim uh, faith and culture. Um, and these are numbers from the Central Bureau of the Statistics uh, from this year. And of that, the Moroccan and Turkish um, share is a plus minus 95%. So 95% of the Muslims in the Netherlands are either Moroccan or Turkish. Some other notable segments, Suriname and a former colony of the Netherlands, uh, Somali, Iraqi, uh, and uh, Afghan, Iranian, and Syrian. And um, the, the share of Indonesian Muslims is, is, uh, is rather small if you compare it with the, the, the other communities, uh, Muslim communities in the Netherlands. So maybe some interesting uh, facts about the uh, two biggest Muslim communities in the Netherlands uh, are that the Turkish uh, communities um, that they are um, they have they have let's say they have uh, they have organized themselves quite well. And these uh, organizations are transnational religious organizations such as uh, Mili Gurush, Suleymanchi, and obviously probably known to you is D the Dianet uh, representing the Turkish state. And the Moroccan religious organizations are more locally and more loosely organized. And an interesting thing to know is that the last bullet is that uh, if you come in the Netherlands and you speak about Indonesians, uh, people don't tend to think of Muslims in the first place. So um, that's why that, uh, that, that's, that's an interesting perception because I think uh, in, in other countries, uh, maybe in the Middle East or in uh, Australia, as examples, uh, Indonesians are more perceived as Muslims. Uh, than in the Netherlands, and that 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 is a totally different story, and it, ha it has to do with history and colonialism. But uh, it's probably outside of the scope of, of our presentation. Almarhum, the writer, uh, the, sorry, the author of the Eilat Quran, um, Sofian Siragar, he belonged to a small group of Muslims having had a a relative high Islamic education in the Middle East, and this group came to the Netherlands in the 1970s among which was uh, Abdurrahman Wahid, uh, the late Abdurrahman Wahid, Gusdur, uh, who was founder of the PPMA and uh, later become, became president of the Republic of uh, Indonesia. So this is a, a, a little bit of a background. An overview of uh, some Quran, of, of the Quran translations in Dutch, so the very first known Quran translation in Dutch stems from 1641 by Barend Adriaans. Uh, I have to move my screen a little bit. Uh, Berensma, based, uh, based entirely on a German translation by Salomon Schweiger uh, from 1616. And the first Dutch Quran translation of the 20th century was actually by a uh, by an Indonesian uh, uh, who who, go, who went by the name Sudowo and uh, printed uh, well in uh, in the last century, early last century. Uh, the Eilat Quran itself uh, was issued in 1996, 
and it was the first Quran translation from Arabic to Dutch by a Sunni Muslim. And after the Eid al-Quran, there, there has been some uh, other translations by Sunni Muslims, among which are, uh, here you see, uh, Glorieuze Quran, uh, Levende Quran, and Interpretatie van Betekenis van de Quran by Abu Ismail, uh, pretty well known. And we will go further into the other uh, translations in Dutch uh, further on uh, by George. Uh, a little bit bio of the author of the Eid al-Quran. He was born in 1951 in Tapanuli, uh, Sumatra Uttara. Uh, that's North Sumatra. Uh, that is not Aceh, but it's just south of Aceh. He studied Sharia at the, uh, 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 yeah, in Yogyakarta and obtained a BA degree and further on, you can see that he uh, went on to obtain his PhD degree in 1994 in Sudan. And he was an important figure in some, uh, uh, several Islamic organizations in the Netherlands. He was chairman uh, of the um, uh, ICMI, um, yeah, the European chapter of ICMI, and it's an Indonesian Association for Muslim Intellectuals. He was uh, even uh, active in, in Indonesian politics for a while and also contender, as, as a contender for the presidential elections in 2014. And he founded uh, the Indonesian Stichting Rotterdam, which is a, um, a foundation for Indonesians um, and also Indonesian Muslims. And um, uh, I'm happy to see that there are some uh, people from ESR in, in this call. And uh, he passed away on 23rd of October in Serbia uh, four years ago. So maybe I can give the word now to George for this part. Well, yes, I will go ahead with uh, uh, some notes about the history and context of the Eil Quran. Um, so in general, we can say that uh, yeah, until the 90s, there was a lack of an absence of a Dutch translation by a Sunni Muslim, uh, which would be accepted uh, uh, by Dutch speaking Muslims in general. As we already saw, uh, the, the Muslim communities are very diverse from a ethnic uh, perspective, uh, perspective of view. Uh, actually, uh, before we go into the uh, translation of the late Sirigar, we have to mention uh, translation which was made by a, a non-Muslim uh, scholar, uh, which is called, the, which we call here the Lame House Translation. And this translation, uh, which appeared in 1989, if I'm not mistaken, you can uh, check it up in the slide uh, before. Uh, yeah, actually, it was the starting point for, uh, for Sirgar, um, who decided to make his own translation. Um, before he started uh, this process, uh, there uh, was an impogium that took place in 1990 with Lame House. In a, in a, if I'm not mistaken, in a, in a, a Moluccan uh, mosque. Uh, in Kerk. In Little Kerk, to be honest, it's, which is close to Rotterdam uh, for people who know the Netherlands. And uh, yeah, that was actually a starting point because, yeah, he, he was in a, uh, to a certain extent, he was not satisfied uh, with the way Lamehouse uh, yeah, made his translation. Uh, after Sirigar's death in uh, 2017, yeah, yeah, well, there has been a seventh a reprint. Uh, which has been issued by uh, ESPO, which is the kind of organization for uh, Islamic uh, schools, schools in the Netherlands, school school uh, school boards. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. Uh, so that's the reason why, why we actually uh, yeah sit here right now because uh, what we did is editing uh, the the El Quran based on personal notes by the author. Uh, with suggestions for improvements. Some of these notes were in Dutch and some of these notes 
which he uh, wrote in a, actually in a version of the Eilu Quran were written in Arabic. So what we primarily did was trying to make a new versions based on these suggestions. Okay, when we talk about the myth, uh, methodology of the Quran, uh, well, I already mentioned that uh, the, the translation of Lehm and Lehm House uh, was the starting point for Sirigar to start making uh, his own translation. Well, what Lehmann has aimed for, which can be made up of, uh, of his own translation uh, from his introductory notes, that he wanted to make a translation as literal as possible within uh, the framework of authoritarian opinions within the uh, Sunni Tafsir tradition in understandable language. Um, yeah, well, it's interesting because Lehmash was not a Muslim in, in himself, but he aimed to, to make a translation that corresponds to uh, the way Muslims understand the Quran in, uh, themselves. Now, one of the, the main commentary of Sirega was that, uh, was that Lehmash, uh, according to him, was inconsistent in his methodology. Mm, he said that he, uh, in, in some instance, he translates metaphorically. In some cases, he opts for literal translation. Well, according to Sirigar's view, uh, and that kind of instances, uh, interpretation should be needed uh, to make it uh, understandable in terms of how Muslims understand the Quran. Now, what does the uh, met methodology of Sirigar aim? And what, what does it do? Well, it, it, there are many similarities, as you can see. So he kind of adopts Lehmann's idea of a translation in a Dutch, which is uh, uh, understandable. Uh, he also opts for a literal translation, if possible, uh, and opts for an exegetical translation. Yeah, if it demands so, according to the uh, authoritative views of uh, the famous uh, Tafsirs. Uh, and just like Lehmann's, he also aims to make a translation uh, in accordance with uh, Muslim, uh, Muslim theology and the way Muslims understand Quran. Well, what, what does it mean in practice? Uh, well, that we, 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 can, uh, we can see what it does in practice just by com uh, comparing some of the translations uh, from the house looking at the comment of Sirga, actually uh, we took most of the comments from uh, an article that the late Sufyan Sirga wrote in, uh, uh, in Arabic, which was once, once printed by the uh, Saudi government and which can be checked up and found on the internet for the ones uh, who can read Arabic. Uh, so that's uh, where we base uh, uh, these notes on in the, this presentation. Uh, but uh, let's take, for example, we see uh, uh, one of the verses, actually first, uh, uh, first 15 of the fourth chapter in the Quran, which reads, if translated as literally as possible, and if there is one among you women who commits an atrocity. Well, I highlighted the word atrocity uh, because according to uh, Sirigar, his comment is, that the word al fahisha which is rendered atrocity according to lame house, uh, is used as an abomination. So in the meaning of al khabath uh, in Arabic, while uh, the, the exegesis on this uh, issue makes clear, according to Sidigar, that uh, al fahisha in this context should be understood as a zina or untucht in Dutch. And so uh, when we, we look we look this first up in the in the in the Quran, we, uh, we see indeed that this has been implemented in the version of Sirigar. So it reads, uh, I will read the literally translation in English, and the one of your wife who commits fornication. Could you um come to a close within the next two minutes or so? Yeah, that's fine. Um 
Okay, I think I think we split speed. We will speed up the process. Yep. Um, well, maybe uh, some something about the footnotes uh, as a closing uh, statement. Yeah. So I think we we. Do you want to go to the academic comparison? Or? Mm, I, I think just the footnotes on, uh, and then and then we finish it. Okay. okay. Yeah. 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 So um, there are some. Um, translations in Dutch language. Uh, so George mentioned the one by Lehmhuis, and then there is the Edele Koran, and then there is the one very well known nowadays by Abu Ismail. And these three, they, well, they, there is a linkage between the three. And uh, we can say that the Lehmhuis, uh, Lehmhuis um, edition was, uh, was the point of departure. The Edle Quran, the Sirigar translation, uh, might be viewed as a response to the Lehmhuis edition, but distinguished by three things. One is that certain Arabic terms have not been translated directly. So the late author opted to, to choose them because no translation would, would do justice to the specific Arabic terms. And also introducing some Dutch neologisms, so new Dutch uh, words or vocabulary to to make sure that uh, the, the the Arabic is properly translated, and also the use of footnotes to provide explanation on certain verses translations. And may I uh, ask uh, attention for one verse, which is probably known to some of you, that is the verse um, thirty four of um, the fourth chapter. And um, well, this is a uh, example in which also the author was uh, has evolved in interpreting the meaning, because this is about um, the word doroba, um, which uh, which has several meanings in the Quran, uh, among which is dis to distance, to emigrate, or to isolate, or to strike. So um, the author has chosen to add a uh, footnote in which he explains that uh, textually it should it, it can be translated as to strike Doroba, uh, but contextually, uh, looking from um, the, um, the 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 purpose of um, uh, uh, the basis of the relationship between husband and wife and the family. Uh, being uh, based on uh, love and respect that could not be uh, interpreted as striking and should be interpreted as um, as isolating. Isolating, isolating. Yeah, or take yeah. distance, actually. Take distance, yeah. yes. It's, a, it's kind of uh, okay. immense, immense, uh, immense uh, perspective. Yes, 